all weren't sure where you were. This is the lightning talks for DebConf 11. People submitted lightning talks via email, uh, and I offered to curate them. Uh, so they're five minutes each. Uh, at the end of five minutes, I'm just cutting people off. People, I'm going to give them a minute to set up. Um, so that's basically it. Uh, our first lightning talk is Vagrant Cascadian on DGKFBSDTSP. So, uh, DGKFBSTTSP, fairly pronounceable. Um, uh, you're probably wondering what it is. I'll get to that. Uh, and then I'll talk about some bugs that kind of came about as a consequence of exploring this idea. And, uh, and then we'll talk about some of the bad consequences. And we'll get into the uh, future, because it's not, all hope is not lost, and even more futuristic, uh, uh, terrible ideas. So, uh, DGKFBSTTSP stands for Debian GNU K FreeBSD Terminal Server Project. I work on LTSP. It's a thin client implementation. And for whatever reason, I'm obsessed with porting it over to K FreeBSD. So, uh, uh, Jim McQuillan uh, likes to point out uh, what the L in LTSP stands for. So uh, one of the important steps uh, in doing a thin client system is getting network booting to work. So uh, I looked around in the k bsd code base and uh, looked at the kernel, found that there were some options to enable boot p, which is kind of like an older version of DHCP. And I figured, OK, we, we turn on some of these options. And you know, uh, we've got NFS root. And you, know, you, you do that on a Linux kernel, and everything comes out Right, right? I mean, it, you know, you can boot to the network, you mount the root file system, you proceed from there. Uh, so uh, the maintainers of uh, the K3BSD image package seemed to think that was a good idea as well. So uh, they committed it to SVN, included it in the next upload, and I figured uh, I'd give it a try. So, um, well, some of these assumptions were wrong. Um, so basically, uh, when you enabled those features, it forces booting from the network. Uh, and so uh, we got a kernel uploaded into unstable. And uh, no matter what kind of medium you were trying to boot from, no matter what boot arguments you passed to it, it just tried to boot over the network and try and mount an NFS root file system. Uh, so indefinitely hangs looking for a DHCP reply. Uh, no matter what you wanted to boot from. Uh, so uh, that got reverted pretty quickly. Um, all hope is not lost. Fairly recently, uh, Robert Milan uh, uh, commented on the bug and explained a process that sounds fairly painful by which uh, you, instead of compiling all of the network modules into the kernel, uh, it, you enable them as modules and you load them uh, from grub. So uh, you, you just load all of your network modules from the grub bootloader because K3BSD doesn't have any dynamic way of loading, your, loading modules. Uh, so that sounds kind of painful. Uh, I've also uh, looked at uh, Debian Installer has something that's kind of like an init ramfs for uh, K3BSD. Uh, so maybe we could do that uh, much like you do for a typical Linux system. Uh, you boot into the, the network, you load your init RD, and then you load the modules you need and do everything in user space. Wouldn't that be elegant? Um, so uh, hopefully, in not too much short order, uh, I'll be uh, obsessing over this and trying to figure out ways to actually make it work. Future bad ideas. <laughs> DGHTSP. It's a little bit shorter to pronounce, but pretty weird. Uh, again, I'll be uh, hassled by upstream repeatedly about uh, what crazy things I've been doing. Um, that's about it, really. Uh, so, yeah, have a good one. Thank you, Vagrant. That was uh, under five minutes. Uh, so, 
Um, up next is um, Didier. Um, Thank you. And this is, um, let me just uh, get the monitors hooked up. Sorry about that. Um, Uh. Nope, no, I cannot make it louder. That's the loudest that it gets. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. Is this a lightning tool? Okay. Okay, so space bar. To okay, space bar. Great. So I'm here for five minutes to talk to you about the Debian Swiss knife. It's an idea that we had on the Debian.ch mailing list. We have already sorted out all details, and now I'm very happy and proud to present the outcome of this project. So, some facts: we all use Debian, and it usually runs on computers, but hardware sometimes needs to be fixed, and the Swiss knives, they are small, they are useful, as the model we will, uh, I, am able, I am about to show you is able to fix computers, well, somehow, and they fit in a pocket. So we have two models that we want to propose for selling. The first one is the Cyber, Cyber Tool 29. Um, it has 28 tools, and uh, you can load some uh, Allen keys. Uh, to unbrick or brick your computer. The cost uh, is supposed to be something around 41 Swiss francs, that is 70 kilometers, and you will, <laughs> you will need to pay the shipping uh, plus to that. Uh, one thing to note is that uh, there is a minimum amount of 25 uh, for us to be able to have the Debian branding on it. Uh, the other model is slightly bigger, but um, this one is usually only to break your computer or cut down cheese or sausages. <laughs> to open wire bottles. Thank you very much. It has a little less tools, but it's bigger, so 11 tools. It weighs um, 100 grams. The price is 34 francs, and it, which is about uh, 59 kilometers. And um, it has a minimum amount of uh, 30... Um, 30 pieces to be ordered. So those are the two models. One thing to note is that the colors um, are only blue and or black. Um, the red one is only the one you buy without the Debian branding. Um, so you can also reverse the color. You can have the big one in black or blue or the small one in black or blue. I hope that's clear. Um, about the prices, so as I told, you can buy them in black or blue. The models there are only these two that we, we are about to order uh, and no else. You can also buy other Swiss Debian knives, Swiss knives, but without the Debian branding if you want, by yourself. <laughs> or if we organize the bid in, in the DevConf 13 in Switzerland, you will be able to buy multiple uh, Swiss knives. So one thing to note is that the gift box is included and the more people buy knives, it's less expensive for everyone. Um, and so the prices that I showed are the maximum prices we expect to, to, to have, but if more people buy, we will lower the prices. And any profit goes to Debian through the Debian CH Association, which is good. And if you want one, just go on the wiki and register yourself on merchandise slash Swiss knives or mail info at debian.ch. And the delay in order to be able to buy those relatively soon is the end of August. So please run. And that's all. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Um, next up uh, is Lunar. Um, we're going to give a minute to connect the video stream.
All right. So here one, we go. One, one two. Hmm. Uh, so this talk is called Return to the Desert Island. Um, or, well, the subtitle is Should Lib Econest Truly Be in Maine? Um, so this all started with Clementine. Clementine is a modern music player, like it's basically a mimics uh, what the old Amarok was, like 1.4, before it started to get bloated and having many, many options. And one of my coworkers was wondering why Clementine was on Debian and wanted to package it. So we started that process and I was helping him uh, do so. Um, hey, Thomas. Um, and so we had to, it had an embedded code copy. So we had to, um, he had to, pa to pre prepare a package for LibreConest. And that got, I mean, we got it packaged and in Debian, but still, Libeconest is a fr strange beast. Because the description of Libeconest is uh, a QT library for communication with the Econest platform. What the fuck is that? Uh, so the Econest is actually a web service that is um, advertised as making music smarter. And the bottom line of the, of the website says, the Econest knows more about music content and consumers than anyone. I mean, what? This is a little bit scary. Uh, and actually, so Libeconest got accepted into main, but actually the code is, yeah, it's free software. It is, it is GNU uh, GPL version two or later, but what actually the code is about, it's about making HTTP request to a specific website that is actually encoded in the source code. So using HTTP to the host that is fixed, developer.econest.com. And it's only about making those uh, REST requests to gather some data uh, from this Econest platform. Uh, this is what people call the cloud these days. Uh, it's pretty dark cloud in my opinion, but and that got me at some point. So we got into main, but I was a little bit, uh, I don't know, not feeling really good about it because at, at some point I got I got back to the policy, you know, and the policy says about the country the country archive area that uh, it contains supplemental packages intended to work with Debian distribution, but which requires software outside of the distribution to either build or function. I mean, the Econest platform is a software which actually uh, is outside of Debian, and if you don't, like, there is no way it, the, the LibEconest library is useful mm -hmm. if you don't have that software available through its HTTP requests. Um, so, and one of the way, I, I, was, I was thinking, okay, should, shouldn't LibEconest be in main? Uh, sh should it be in main? Shouldn't be in country then? And so I was wondering, okay, what do you put in country? What, what should we put in main? What's, what's the difference? And I got back to you also thinking about this desert island idea uh, that we used, or some people have used to um, determine if the license was free or not, according to the DFSG. And I was wondering, okay, maybe we should uh, tell ourse ask ourselves the question like that. Can this software, if, if it's not, if it needs to connect to a network service, can this service be run by some friends that would like be together on a closed network on an island with only uh, Debian Mirror? In that case, Jabber would be, would be, for example, in main, like any Jabber client, but LibreConnect would be in country. And probably the MSN plugin for telepathy would be in country too, because we don't have a hand on the, on the, MSN servers. Uh, so, yeah, and if you take like the DebConf uh, 18 idea, and if you are on a boat and we have no network, uh, we have no internet uplink, then what happens? Um, so, yeah, you should also actually ask yourself about that. Probably you maintain something that could not actually function on a boat on a, on a desert island. So my point is, if we don't start to think a little bit more about that, then we are totally lost. We have to go back. Well, that's it.
Thank you, Lunar. Next up, we have Keo, who is presenting um, how to turn a website into free software. Uh, again, we'll give a minute for getting the monitor set up, which is always fun in games. 60, you want 85 hertz if you can. There is a web, there's a web page on the wiki um, that has a set of XR and R incantations that makes these monitors work correctly. Uh, it's effectively a shell script on the wiki. So you're running into the same problem that I ran into, and you really do need the full thing. Do you want to step off? We'll trade off to somebody else, and I'll get you the right commands. Okay, next up, uh, who, all right, Igor, can you, are you ready? You just want SM? All right. Um. No. Nope. On, on this monitor. Yeah. All right. You have your microphone there. Wow. Hey, it's working. Hello. I'm actually going present in my natural uh, position, so that is sitting. Um, I'm Igor Galic from the Apache Software Foundation, and uh, I would like to shake the drum a little bit for my pet project, which is the Apache Traffic Server. Um, well, what is it? It's a proxy server, uh, which can be used for forward and reverse proxying, and it's better than Squid. So if you don't like Squid, please use Traffic Server. That's the short, uh, short story. Um, long story is it's a very, very old piece of software and gone through very uh, much incarnations. It uh, belonged to a company called Intomi, was bought by Yahoo, and then it was sort of um, not quite dropped over the wall uh, to Apache. It was actually a very long and painful process uh, to to get it open source because it had lots of patent issues, uh, but now it's here, and uh, we're trying to make make it better. It's um, written in C++, but that's okay. We <laughs> we're using it very responsibly, and it has a, a clean C API which you can use to write plugins for it. So if you need a proxy server, which is amazingly, amazingly fast to build your CDN or whatever, then by all means use traffic server, extend it, visit the website, subscribe to our mailing lists, come and bug us in the channel. We're uh, nice, friendly and receptive, helpful, but uh, actually you don't need our help because uh, our documentation is great and it's so intuitive to use. So. Please, please use it. <laughs> okay. Sorry? Yes, it actually is. We have uh, a guy sitting in the channel and packaging it for uh, Debian, and it's also in uh, Ubuntu already. And he's very active and doing bug fixes sometimes and uh, bug reports most of the time. So, yes, it is packaged. Laish, I think, has uh, sponsored him, and he's... Um, 
but he's not uploading it anymore because uh, the guy became maintainer, uh, I think, the other day. I think so, yeah. You're not up to date. Okay, so any other questions? Like, what do I need a, uh, a proxy server for? If not, then I'm actually done. So please just visit the website and use it. Um, because it speaks HTTP as opposed to varnish. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Igor. Okay. My talk is uh, how to turn a website into free software with dark sci-fi and uh, virtualization. A bit of background. I uh, run a site called uh, piperka.net. It has been in operation since uh, 2005 and uh, it's got a lot of uh, custom code and uh, all sorts of uh, badly designed uh, stuff, but I'm trying to improve that. I'm not really talking about that's here now. And I would like to get others involved with the website, but it's a bit uh, difficult. I used to do everything by just uh, editing files in place, uh, Perl files and such, and uh, it's not uh, really scalable, and I don't want to give others accounts to do that on my server. And, uh, if I packaged it and uh, distributed a source, then uh, it would be difficult also. I can't expose users' data, and uh, I have used it uh, as a private file store and all kinds of uh, such things, and I don't want to expose those either, and uh, it's difficult for anyone uh, to set up a test system from that, even for me. And if somebody did something with it, it would be hard for me to accept any patches. And if I made any updates myself, it would be hard to get others to get those. So I needed to fix my workflow. I set up a development server on my own computer, virtualized. And I'm using Fi fully automatic installation to set up users, permissions, and uh, database, and all the directories and such. And once that's in place, it's as easy to run a Fi soft update to set up a, a test system. And the second part of this was to use the Darks distributed version control system to manage the changes. I set up a trigger that copies all the files and uh, restarts any services. And uh, with uh, that, I can uh, just uh, make a patch and uh, send it to the test server. And uh, if it uh, didn't work the first time, I can uh, modify it and do it again. And uh, once uh, I'm happy with uh, what I have. It's just a dark pass to the production server. So with uh, that, I can uh, 
let the authors uh, install a te test system for themselves too. The first step is to set up a virtualized machine for themselves. It's a bit involved, but if you have uh, done it uh, once, it's not that difficult anymore. And um, they basically need a basic Debian system installed first. And the uh, second part is to get the source code with darks get, copy the SSH key to the test server, run a setup script, it copies all the files to the test server and runs file on it and, and until it, when it's done, they can use a web server to just connect to the website. So that's all it takes and uh, I'm I can uh, accept patches easily with that and uh, they, they would use the same workflow as I tested things on the test server and uh, send their patches to me and it's all available under MIT license. I'm done. All right. Thank you. to you once you're hooked up. So this is a presentation by Petter about uh, Fix My Street. Is that right? Yep. Fix My Street. There you are. So I'm going to talk about what um, I've been able to uh, release in Norway uh, the last half a year or so. Uh, it's basically a British site ported to Norway, and it's uh, a site giving the uh, citizens uh, the ability to help the government uh, improve the public infrastructure. Fix My Street, this is the um, British site, is uh, a very simple site where anyone can go in and put in a postcode or a name of the allocation, and uh, then they will be able to uh, report a problem with public infrastructure to uh, to the local councils. How does it work? Very simple. You uh, end up with uh, reports like reports like this. Um, I'm just showing one of the um, British uh, reports. Here you can see on the map where it is. You will have some information about what it is and when it was reported to the council. Um, I don't really know any um, British names or postcodes. I'll go to the Norwegian side inse instead. You put in a postcode. You are presented with uh, the map. Let's hope the wireless keeps working. So um, uh, the reason I'm showing it here is it's based on Debian. It's uh, been ported to a Norwegian, uh, an, a Norwegian environment from the British environment. And the major part of the porting effort was actually to rewrite the application to stop using British geo, geo coordinates and instead using GPS coordinates. This means that uh, it is now trivial to port to any country in the world. I would expect it would take less than two days to get it up and running for any country if you have the geo data that is required to actually uh, get this working. Yeah. Here we have it. <coughs> it is showing the uh, uh, problem reported around the area where I put the postcode in. It's uh, showing if they are solved. Green is solved, red is not. And hopefully the OpenStreetMap map will show up soon. So it also makes it possible to see if you actually need to report the problem. So the console doesn't have to get multiple reports on the same problem, and you can save sp time, of course. So uh, to get this working, this is basically two services. You need the uh, MapIt service, 
which is a web API to uh, map uh, coordinates to uh, consoles and postcodes to coordinates. Uh, we have uh, used OpenStreetMap as our data source for the geodata, basically the boundaries of the municipalities in Norway are not public information. That sounds kind of strange, but we need the geo coordinate, not the drawings, not a picture of a map. We need the GPS coordinates of the boundaries, and we are not we have not been able to get it so far. So we're using OpenStreetMap uh, estimates instead. The mapped service is feeded with uh, data from OpenStreetMap, and you can look up a given coordinate. This is 59, <coughs> uh, 59.10 or comma 10. And you will uh, get a very nice uh, map and information about any console, any administration covering that point. And here you can see the National Road Authority, the National Shoreline Administration, City Council of Larvik, the Road, road Authorities of Region South, and the West Pole uh, local area. And if you move forward to uh, Municipality will actually be able to see the area covered by that mus municipality. Similarly, you can do the same for um, yeah, for um, postcodes. One nice feature with OpenStreetMap, now with the Fix My Street, is that it's able to export uh, GeoRSS, which can be visualized on uh, on Google Maps or any other mapping service. And recently, I've been adding an Open311 API to allow anyone to search more uh, uh, interestingly <coughs> from the database. You can get all the open problems in Trondheim, for example, as XML or as a GeoRSS and show it on the map. Uh, we can get uh, given categories uh, like the uh, all the problems with water supply in, uh, in Norway. You can get all the problems with uh, holes in the road, that kind of thing. You can also get all closed reports. And the target I've had in mind for this uh, API, search API, is journalists looking for uh, problems in the local area. But also councils can do it if they want to uh, uh, <coughs> extract all day reports in a different cat <coughs> uh, a specific category. Uh, it's based on Debian Squeeze, missing 12 Perl modules, I think, uh, in Squeeze to get it running. was pretty trivial to uh, get up and running. Uh, you need a PostGIS database and uh, Apache server and Catalyst for the latest version. And um, it would be very nice to see it uh, spreading all, all over the world. I think that's five minutes. Thank you. All right. We have uh, you want this one? Yeah. You can take it. Could build up, so I think it's fun. Okay, now he can't stop me. That's very good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, it seems I can't really make an impression by using screen methods for presentations anymore. Um, I see it was four years now since I created screen methods at last, uh, fourth last DevConf. So this is not the topic of my talk. Um, I'm going to show you two things that I've been working on the last. Um, here and the weeks before, pixel-free screenshots. First one is the HTML copy target for GNOME Terminal. And I'll just demonstrate what it means. Here I have a GNOME Terminal. Actually, it's not a GNOME Terminal, but it's a test binary for the VTE library which, uses, which GNOME Terminal uses. And I run a command which has some colorful output. And I want to paste this onto my blog. And losing all the colorful output is a bit sad. So um, once this is in... Um, is in, in GNOME Terminal, I can copy this. I can go to whatever program supports pasting HTML. I can paste it. 
and I got all the colors. Um, this also works, for example, with uh, um, OpenOffice. Okay, then um, that's the first thing. The next thing is the TTK Vector Screenshot Program. And again, I'll just show what it does. Here's a GTK program. It has to be GTK3 to, for it to work. I run take vector screenshot. I get this nice button. I click on the button. I click on the application. I can save this. Um, just one. And I get a PDF file that I can open. OK, it looks interesting. It looks like a picture. But um, if you pay attention, we can zoom in. And this is purely vector graphics, and I can copy. Ah, <laughs> oh, yeah, there it is. This is what I just copied out of the um, Unicode program. Um, and it also works with more complex applications. Now, I was hoping that I could see myself here. Um, it seems that that didn't work. But still, I can take a screenshot of Epiphany, which is a web browser. I can save the PDF file. I can open it. And there's the, PM, the whole screen. I can select not only the buttons up here, but also the HTML text. And it's, again, fully vectorized. And yeah, that's it. Um, the first one is still only available as a bug report with a patch. The other one is in Debian. Um, that was the last lightning talk. And thanks for that, Conif 11. That was, uh, that was our lightning talks for the conference. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming. We have uh, one more. We have the final closing ceremony starting in uh, about 25 minutes in this room. Thank you.